in the blood-soaked world of international drug cartels, for the top cops of U.S. law enforcement, Joaquin Guzman was public enemy number one, a title not bestowed on anyone since the gangster era of Al Capone and John Dillinger. He earned that status by putting more narcotics on American streets than anyone in history. Guzman, known by the nickname El Chapo, Spanish for shorty, gained an outsized reputation. He bribed his way out of a Mexican prison in 2001, and for the next 13 years, he used money, violence, and gee whiz escapes worthy of a James Bond villain to avoid capture. A myth grew that he was untouchable. But tonight we will show you how in February Chapo was finally caught. After the death of Osama bin Laden, El Chapo became the most wanted man in the world. So getting him was a big deal for you. Absolutely. In my world, it was like winning the Super Bowl, winning the World Series. This was the actual trophy. He was number one? Absolutely. This fight against drugs... Derek Maltz was in charge of the DEA's Special Operations Division, tasked with finding Chapo. What put him at the top of the list? Making billions of dollars, having a reach around the world, in Asia, in Australia, in Africa, in Europe, putting poison on the streets, not just in the United States, but all over the world. Jim Dinkins was head of Homeland Security Investigations. He pursued El Chapo for more than a decade. He's a monster that happened to rise up in a criminal organization that was making billions of dollars. A monster. A monster. Until both men retired in recent months, Dinkins and Maltz helped coordinate the U.S. hunt for Chapo. His real name, Joaquin Guzman. Incredibly, Guzman was on the Forbes magazine list of billionaires. He was also known to be one of the most violent drug traffickers in the world. As his Sinaloa cartel fought to dominate the drug trade, the war between the cartels turned the southern side of the U.S.-Mexico border into one of the most dangerous places on Earth. Thousands of people electrocuted, beheaded, chopping off limbs, throwing people in acid. He committed some ruthless crimes in Mexico. He's in custody now and doesn't look quite so ferocious, cowed, his head bowed. But until he was apprehended by Mexican Marines, Joaquin Guzman, the illiterate son of a farmer, ran a multinational criminal empire. They had not only transportation, they had manufacturing, they had domestic and local distribution channels. Very sophisticated with narco subs, with shipping vessels, with 747s, with private vessels, with tractor trailers, rail cars. The drug cartel was run like a, uh, you know, a Fortune 500 company. He employed some very sophisticated counterintelligence operations to make sure that if law enforcement was getting close, they would never actually get to him. Chapo devised ingenious smuggling methods. Marijuana, huh? He packed drugs into fake cucumbers and bananas and mixed them with shipments of real produce. But the thing he worked hardest on was making sure he could always get away. Chapo was the first Mexican drug trafficker to hire architects and engineers to build elaborate tunnels, complete with railways to ferry drugs under the U.S.-Mexico border, and he spent millions adapting them to use as escape routes from his many hideouts. This is very tight, very hot, very close. We went down into a labyrinth of interlocking tunnels with the Mexican Marines who chased him. Unbelievable. This was one of the ways Chapo was able to elude capture time and time again. The Americans thought he was being tipped off by corrupt Mexican officials, but the Mexicans bristled at the accusation they could not be trusted. So there were suspicions on both sides of the Absolutely. border. Absolutely, yes. So what was different this time? The U.S. government and the Mexican government basically said enough is enough, and we actually, you know, rolled up our sleeves got in a room, argued a little bit, put all the intelligence on the table, shared it with the Mexicans, and ultimately uh, grabbed Chapo. It started with a routine smuggling probe by Homeland Security investigators at the border crossing in Nogales, Arizona. A wiretap unexpectedly led to a phone linked to one of Chapo's men. U.S. agents followed that thread for more than two years. Worked it from phone to phone, 
device to device, person to person, until they actually had wired out the communication structure. And the communication structure was the key. It was a very clear picture to us on what was happening and how he was running his business. Several U.S. law enforcement agencies, the DEA, the Marshals, Homeland Security, and the FBI, were all pursuing Guzman separately. But this time, they decided to streamline their efforts and funnel everything through the DEA. And we had uh, one voice in how we were going to pursue uh, sharing intelligence with the Mexican officials. Was that significant, that important, to have that one voice? Absolutely. You can't do a job against Chapo Guzman unless you're working together. And Tomas Zeron was that voice on the Mexican side. Attention! Zeron is chief of the investigative agency of the Prosecutor General of the Republic, Mexico's version of the FBI. The main U.S. assistance was surveillance, um, wiretapping, phone surveillance, and that sort of thing. Yo lo englobaría en tecnología. I will just tell you they help us with technology because they're really good in technology and that will encapsulate everything. Zeron, in turn, tapped the Mexican Marines to execute the plan. They are elite special forces, highly trained and known for using deadly force. We watched one of their training sessions, an assault on a mock-up of a cartel hideout. And we traveled with the Marines to Sinaloa, a remote state on the Pacific coast, and to its capital, Culiacan, Chapo's base of operations where his cartel still rules. It was here in Culiacan on February 12th, after weeks of secret surveillance, the Marines started to move on the cartel, rounding up Chapo's henchmen, who started to talk. There was a lot of close associates of Chapo that were arrested over these periods of time, and there was information developed that was provided to the Mexicans. So it wasn't just technical information, bank information, surveillance information, documents, telephone information. Based on intelligence collected on both sides of the border, Marines raided a series of cartel safe houses on February 17th. They seized more than three tons of crystal meth and cocaine, automatic weapons and ammunition, a rocket launcher, and a diamond-encrusted pistol with the initials of Joaquin Guzman. They also arrested one of Chapo's top lieutenants, a man called The Nose, and he flipped quickly. He told them where Chapo was hiding and how he planned to escape. Several weeks later, the Marines took us to the place where they were told Chapo was hiding. This nondescript house in the midst of a middle-class neighborhood was a fortress, they had to ram their way through a reinforced steel door. It took you eight minutes to open the door? Sí. Ocho. Ocho minutos. When they got inside, El Chapo was nowhere to be found, but they did find this. Uh, the tub. Look at this. The escape hatch. The bathtub was equipped with a hydraulic lift. It's been turned off. Very steep. He couldn't have done this quickly but underneath is the entranceway to a hidden tunnel. While Marines were battering down the front door, they say Guzman, startled, barefoot, in his underwear, clambered down these stairs and escaped through this tunnel with his bodyguard and two women. This was part of a maze of tunnels connected to the city sewers of Culiacan, and it turns out to six other safe houses, all equipped with hydraulically controlled bathtub escape hatches. Our guide told us that even though they had a 10-minute head start, he could hear the fugitives splashing through the water, but they were too far ahead to catch. When the Marines emerged from this spillway by the river, El Chapo had vanished. So what did you think when he got away once again in Culiacan? I never believed that he would ever be captured. Really? I thought he was gone again. I thought he may have been, you know, tipped off but the Mexican Marines just were relentless. And they went from house, through the tunnels, from tunnel to house, from house, and they just kept on going. Chapo and his wife, a one-time beauty queen, their twin toddlers, a nanny, a cook, and his most trusted bodyguard were desperately trying to shake the Marines off their trail. They ditched their phones and got new numbers. 
he's a man on the run. You need money, you need food, you need weapons. And he was also very interested in knowing who had been arrested, I'm sure, and, and what was going on. So it was very hard for him to go into isolation, complete isolation. How was he communicating at this point? I'm sure multiple different ways, but the ways that, you know, that, that were the most vulnerable was back on cell phones. So, so he's back using the cell phones. Back using cell phones, and you can't, um, now you're on the run, so how they're going to know what number to call. You have to tell them, all right, well, I got a new phone number, here it is. Well, you just told us to. Five days later, the Americans traced the phone of Chapo's bodyguard to the resort city of Mazatlan, 136 miles away, and to this beachfront building. They shared that intelligence with the Mexicans. At exactly 6.40 a.m. on February 22nd, the Marines crashed through the door of number 401. When he saw the red beads of their laser sights speckled on his chest, the bodyguard threw down his rifle and threw up his hands. Next, the Marines burst through the door of the master bedroom, where Chapo's wife stood naked by the bed. A Marine pushed past her and kicked in the bathroom door. There was somebody behind it. It was El Chapo. Back in Mexico City, Tomas Zaron and his team were listening in real time as the high-stakes drama of Chapo's capture unfolded. Was there cheering? Was there high-fiving? La reacción fue de júbilo. No of course it was a jubilee. We felt at that point that we were all one, hoy, that we were all doing something to have a good Mexico. We did not ever anticipate that he'd be captured alive. We thought he'd fight to the death. Were you surprised that he didn't? I was surprised. I was shocked. Shocked? Absolutely shocked. What shocked you more, that he was captured or that he was captured without a shot? Both. Captured without a shot was pretty amazing. The once mighty drug lord who terrorized Mexico and outfoxed his pursuers for 13 years was defeated. Processed like any common criminal, Guzman was fingerprinted, mugshots taken. Then he was paraded before the press like a trophy and loaded onto a helicopter. Looking dazed, scared, and docile, El Chapo was flown to Altiplano Prison, Mexico's supermax. Law enforcement officials vow he will never escape again. The Sinaloa cartel is still in business. It's still deeply involved in drug trafficking. So Guzman is now gone, but has anything really changed? El cartel sigue trabajando. The cartel continues. But even though it continues, we've made detentions after we detained Guzman. We are not going to leave Sinaloa, and we are going to stay there until we dismantle the cartel completely. We know that when you take out bin Laden, that the threat of terrorism did not end. Nor will the threat of drugs end by taking out El Chapo. But it was still worth every bit of effort to take that man off, because it sends a signal that you are touchable. By now, you've probably heard of one of the greatest prison breaks of all time. It happened last July. Joaquin Guzman, known by his Spanish nickname El Chapo, or Shorty, is one of the most notorious and violent drug lords in the world. He was a high-value captive. He had broken out of prison before. This time, he was locked away in a maximum security penitentiary, the tightest prison in Mexico. And yet, he got away. And even more stunning, he did so through a mile-long escape tunnel that opened up right into his shower stall, the only corner of his tiny cell security cameras couldn't see. Even those who caught him last year were shocked by the escape. Gets arrested for the second time, knowing that he escaped once before, goes to prison and is still able to escape a second time. I mean, that, that's something like no other criminal in history that you'll be able to find. Until he retired last year, Jim Dinkins was head of Homeland Security Investigations. He was part of the international manhunt for El Chapo for more than a decade. You know, he was literally in a well-fortified, constructed prison designed to prevent such an escape. The maximum security prison in Mexico. Yes, designed to penetrate people from coming from air and coming from land, but they didn't anticipate him coming from underground. 
So that's exactly what he did, almost from the moment he was delivered here to Altiplano Prison in February 2014, a construction crew from his Sinaloa cartel began digging a tunnel to free him. The walls here are as much as three feet thick. The airspace above is restricted. Cell phones, prison officials say they're jammed for miles around. But none of that made a difference. From almost a mile away, inside this hastily built cinder block structure in a farmer's field, Chapo's men dug down about three stories and then burrowed 4,921 feet straight toward Altiplano. The tunnel went under the prison wall and beneath the plumbing, and with pinpoint accuracy, it emerged directly into the shower stall of Guzman's ground-level cell. It's very difficult to navigate underground. This tunnel, I believe, went from point A to point B with only minor deviations, if any, and that is an engineering marvel in of itself. How uh, difficult is that? It's very, very difficult, but I'm sure when the boss is behind prison, you put your best team and your best foot forward, and they apparently did. At 8.52, the night of Saturday, July 11th, El Chapo ducks into the shower stall behind a privacy wall, the only spot in the five-by-six-foot cell hidden from security cameras. And then he disappears. He climbed down into the tunnel and climbed atop a motorcycle, especially rigged on rail tracks to speed him to freedom. By the time the alarm sounded and a search began, Guzman had vanished into the night. What was your reaction when you heard that El Chapo had escaped again? Disappointed, not shocked. Chuck Rosenberg is head of the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration. He was in a maximum security prison. He had escaped previously in 2001. So it had happened before. We knew, we knew he had uh, intended to do it again. You knew that he was planning to do it again? We knew that uh, he and his uh, folks back in Sinaloa wanted to break him out. We had general chatter maybe a, a year or so before he actually broke out a second time about what they hoped to do. But there was nothing in that information we had about tunnels. You know, he's a notorious tunnel manufacturer and The architect. tunnel king. The tunnel king. You know, he's responsible for more sophisticated tunnels than I think any other person in the history of drug trafficking in Mexico. During the last manhunt for El Chapo, his pursuers discovered this. The tub. Look at this. A tunnel entrance also concealed in the plumbing, in this case, wow. beneath the tub. That's amazing. El Chapo was the first Mexican drug trafficker to hire architects and mining engineers to build elaborate super tunnels, complete with ventilation systems, electricity, and railways to ferry drugs under the U.S.-Mexico border. The border between San Diego and Tijuana is one of the busiest international commercial zones in the world. You'll see a steady stream of trucks passing north and south. What you can't see is that beneath one four-mile stretch of this border, it's crisscrossed with dozens of smuggling tunnels. Why? Because this industrial part of Tijuana is right across the fence from acres and acres of warehouses in the U.S. Drug smugglers dig down inside a building over here, pop up inside a warehouse in the U.S. just a couple hundred yards away. This is where El Chapo's Sinaloa cartel honed its tunneling technique. So when did El Chapo first start digging tunnels here in this area? On record, we have uh, the first tunnel was in 2010. Joe DiMeglio is the chief of the San Diego Tunnel Task Force, made up of agents from Homeland Security, the Border Patrol, and DEA. The task force was established to respond to what the government deems a threat to national security. And down this road, there's been multiple tunnels found in warehouses here. What makes this area so appealing to them? Just the infrastructure on both sides of the border, in Otay Mesa and in Tijuana, you have all the commercial businesses there, import, export, and just the vast amount of warehouses there that are doing legitimate business. And it's easy to conceal an illegitimate business within those warehouses. And it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. How much does it cost them to build one of these tunnels? We've estimated it's cost the, the cartel anywhere between a million to two million dollars. If they have one successful 
push through of narcotics, they paid for that tunnel and then some. One load gets through. One load, not just, you know, one kilo. We're talking tons of narcotics going through. A load of marijuana, for example, could be worth as much as five to six million dollars. Smugglers use the tunnels primarily to move marijuana because it's too bulky, too smelly, too easy to detect to transport over land. There you go. Demeglio's team took us down into one of El Chapo's now closed subterranean passageways. They're dug through the clay-like soil with picks, shovels, and small power tools. You can see the spade marks from the air hammer drill up on the ceiling going across, and you can see how they just worked, worked their way through the tunnel here as they were constructing it. You have the rails, the rail system, the rail cart, the lighting, the ventilation, but it's the concealment method that's they've changed and, have, and, and became more sophisticated. More elaborate, harder to find. Exactly. So what are they putting it under, up on top? This specific entry point for this tunnel was a bathroom floor that was on a hydraulic lift. So the lift actually lowered into another room, which was 30 feet below ground. Some tunnels are so deep, as much as 90 feet underground, the task force has found no technology can detect them. So they rely on wiretaps, tips from informants, or suspicious activity around the warehouses to locate the smuggling tunnels. The tunnel that El Chapo's cartel built to break him out of prison, is there anything comparable to that here? One of my guys actually went down there from the task force and actually walked in that tunnel and observed it. And he came back and I asked him, so what'd you think? He goes, it's no different than what we see here. It's exactly the same. So they learned it here. Every step that they go, every tunnel that they build, they learn from. Along the way, El Chapo, named to Forbes magazine list of billionaires, also learned his vast riches meant almost anything could be had for a price, possibly even his freedom. DEA chief Chuck Rosenberg says he was disgusted by El Chapo's prison break. A tunnel right under the maximum security prison and up into his cell. Up into a shower stall. How does that happen? We work with our Mexican counterparts all the time on cases big and small. There's lots and lots and lots of good people down there, men and women who are with us in this. Uh, there's also a degree of corruption down there that is disappointing, stunning. Pick your adjective. That's how it happens. How high up do his tentacles of corruption and bribes, how high up do they reach? I don't know specifically how high up they reach. My sense is that they're both broad and deep, uh, that they go throughout the Mexican government. U.S. law enforcement officials knew they had a reliable partner in the Mexican Marines the last time they hunted El Chapo. We watched one of their training exercises last year and joined them on patrol in Sinaloa, a mountainous state along Mexico's Pacific coast where the cartel still rules. El Chapo had seven safe houses in the capital, Culiacan, all connected by tunnels. He also had a remote ranch outside the city in the rough terrain of the Sierra Madre. Using intelligence and technology from the U.S., the Mexican Marines nabbed El Chapo in an early morning raid at this apartment in the Sinaloan resort town of Mazatlan. The Marines took him into custody without firing a shot and delivered him to the gates of Altiplano Prison. It seems to me that for somebody to break out of a maximum security prison, that there had to be help from the inside. Logically, there had to be some sort of help. Had to be. He would Logically. have needed blueprints and schematics and... Yeah, unless they just tunneled up and got very lucky and hit his shower stall, you bet they would have needed something. There's no question in my mind that he had help. At the time of El Chapo's prison break, the U.S. government was pressing Mexico to extradite him, send him to trial here. Where was the extradition process when he escaped? We had made our request. They knew of it. The reason we asked for extradition is because his crimes have so grievously injured communities around the United States. And we were concerned that he would do just what he did, escape justice in Mexico. That wouldn't happen here. Guzman's latest daring getaway has only magnified the myth of a criminal mastermind who could outsmart all of his pursuers. 
In Sinaloa, he's a bona fide folk hero. His admirers celebrate his exploits, singing that he laughs at the law. Do you have any idea where he is now? No. You think he would return home to Sinaloa? Don't want to guess. We got him twice. I bet we'll get him again. You do? I do. You're confident you'll get him again? I'm reasonably confident we'll get him again. I am not very confident that we'll ever catch him again. Why is that? Because when you go after Chapo, it's not like going after and arresting your local drug dealer or local criminal. This is somebody you have to bring in a whole team and army, literally, of soldiers and military folks and police officers to go after and secure him. So this is a big operation to go after somebody like Chapo. And it took months, months, and years and years to do that once before. To help Mexico in the manhunt, the U.S. government is once again providing intelligence, equipment, and a $5 million reward. The notorious narco known as El Chapo has achieved one of his greatest aspirations. He's the most famous drug lord of all time. This is our fourth 60-minute story about El Chapo, whose real name is Joaquin Guzman. Our first story came when he was captured after 13 years on the run. We told you then that El Chapo, Spanish for shorty, was on Forbes' list of billionaires and had earned an outsized reputation for his worldwide smuggling empire, his ruthless brutality, and most of all, for his daring getaways, like the one we told you about last year when he vanished from a maximum security Mexican prison through one of his trademark escape tunnels. Then there was our interview with actor Sean Penn, who met Guzman at a hideaway last fall. After El Chapo's stunning prison break, many thought he'd never get caught again. But he was. How? You're about to see. Where in the pantheon of drug traffickers, drug lords, does... El Chapo fall. El Chapo resides at the very top of that hierarchy. Peter Vincent was a senior official and legal advisor of both the Justice Department and Homeland Security during the international manhunt for Guzman. He says after the daring escape last summer, El Chapo became almost delusional. So what precipitated his downfall? He became drunk on his own wine. He started to believe the hype, that he was special, that he was almost a demigod, that he was something truly magical. Hmm. And he became so incredibly arrogant that he thought he was untouchable. Jim Dinkins agrees. As chief of Homeland Security Investigations, he was part of the U.S.-Mexico task force that nabbed El Chapo in 2014. He knew how he was captured last time. And so he had the upper hand, right? He had all the cards in his hand to, to go off into the sunset and to learn from his mistake, but he just couldn't help himself. And he re remained in the public eye. After his first escape from prison in 2001, Guzman virtually disappeared from sight for 13 years, but not this time. Here he gets out of prison and he's on the road being spotted at this place having you know, drinks and this place, you know, um, with his family members. He invited Sean Penn and the actress Kate Del Castillo to come in to see him. Yeah. Did Mexican law enforcement know that these two actors were going in to see El Chapo? Oh, absolutely. They knew that sh where Sean was going to go, when he was going to land. They knew right away. How did they know? Because they were listening in on the cartel's communications and watching. Mexican and U.S. law enforcement reformed the task force that caught El Chapo the last time. They were tracking not just Guzman, but everyone in his inner circle, including his cook, and everyone his lieutenants contacted, including Sean Penn. Did it become sloppy? Definitely. There was more sightings of him in the last six months than there was in the last 10 years before he was captured in 2014. After he escaped the last time, you told us that you were not confident that he would ever be captured again. Yeah. That El Chapo had become a smarter criminal. Yeah. Did you overestimate his intelligence? I truly did. Here he had over a year in prison. 
I presumed he was using that same amount of time to think about how he was going to remain a fugitive for the rest of his life. Mexican officials told us that only 20 days after his escape, the Marines had picked up on Guzman's trail. They created an even smaller team of Mexican Marines, a search block, and they focused on the prize at hand, and that was capturing El Chapo Guzman alive if they absolutely could. Their first opportunity came in early October, just days after Sean Penn's visit. The Marines told us they waited because they didn't want the American actor caught in the crossfire. A team of Marines approached one of El Chapo's mountaintop ranches by Jungle Road, while another group of commandos flew in by helicopter. So what went wrong on that October mission? As I understand it, despite all of El Chapo Guzman's bravado of being a macho, very powerful man, he was running with a child in his arms. A human shield, a baby as a shield? That's the only way uh, that one can rationally see it. So once again, El Chapo got away. In early December, intelligence led the Marines to this house in the sleepy coastal town of Los Mochis in northern Sinaloa. Wiretap intercepts talked about a visit planned by grandma and aunt, code names for El Chapo and his lieutenant known as Cholo Ivan. The Marines watched the house for a month as painters and construction crews came and went. Then, on the morning of Thursday, January 7th, Grandma finally showed up. An assault force quickly moved into position nearby. That evening, someone in the house called out for a large order of tacos, and this armored truck left to go pick up the food. Chapo was having a party. For an incredibly savvy clever, almost a criminal genius that El Chapo Guzman was. He ultimately was done in by very simple tastes. What do you mean? Tacos, tequila, and chicas. At 4.40 a.m. in the pre-dawn hours of Friday, January 8th, the Marines began battering down the gate of Chapo's safe house. We've concealed the identities of the commando leaders for their safety. So when we first knocked on the door of the house, the shooting started. A fierce gun battle erupted. The first Marine through the door was shot in the arm. I watched the videotape. It's very intense. Los elementos de seguridad de Chapo. Chapo's people inside the house were firing high-caliber rounds, grenades, so it was like a war zone. The Marines moved methodically through the house. Chapo's henchmen retreated up the stairs. Just inside the door, one gunman lay dead. Down the hall, four more taken prisoner and the commandos quickly check a walk-in closet covered with full-length mirrors. Upstairs, the Marines find two women, one of them the cook, cowering on the bathroom floor. Outside the house, more commandos fought it out with gunmen who fled across the rooftops. When it was over, there were five cartel members dead and six in custody. But once again, Chapo, with Cholo Ivan, had vanished. A couple of days later, the Marines took us to the safe house in Los Mochis in an armed convoy. Here, just inside the gate, a pool of blood where the Marine was shot. Sangre. Blood. And inside the door, more blood stains. The walls pockmarked with bullet holes and the scars of exploding shrapnel. And remember that walk-in closet? The mirrors masked a hidden door. Behind the secret door, the entrance to one of El Chapo's trademark tunnels. It's connected to a network of storm drains and sewers. It was 45 minutes before they found El Chapo's escape route. That morning, the Marines gave chase. We intensified the search inside the tunnels, opening manhole covers and inserting people into the sewers. Then it started raining, hard. After 20 minutes of rain, we thought that Chapo might drown in the sewers because of the high level of the water. So he popped up out of the manhole right in the middle of a busy street. 
hospital parece que no tuvo otra opción. That was his only option. So this is where he came out. He popped out of this manhole cover, which is about a half mile from the house, straight down the road there. Look carefully at the security camera footage from the gas station across the street. At 8.55 a.m., four hours after the first shots were exchanged, right there, you can see Chapo and Cholo Ivan climbing out of the sewer. And then in this cell phone video, you can see them carjack a white VW Jetta and speed away. The fugitives got only three blocks before the Jetta broke down. So they jacked a second car, a red Ford Focus. But only a couple of miles out of town, that car broke down. Within minutes, the Federal Emergency Center got two reports of hijacked vehicles. On the highway out of town, the Marines found the Ford already on the bed of a tow truck, but no sign of Chapo and his lieutenant. They had been picked up by the federal police and taken to a nearby motel. What were they doing in the back seat of the police car? They weren't talking. They were relaxed, but they looked confused. No one knows why the federal police took Chapo to the motel instead of to jail. But Peter Vincent has a theory. El Chapo undoubtedly said, one, you let me go now, and I will make you wealthier beyond your wild imaginations. If you should choose to decline my most generous offer, I am not only going to kill you, but I am going to rape and kill your wife and your daughters and I'm going to torture your sons. He that, has behaved like that in the past. He has behaved like that virtually his entire criminal career. Bribes and threats. Bribes and threats. Bribes and bullets. And luckily, the Mexican Marines showed up, realized what was going on, and took control of the situation. Chapo was flown to Mexico City for booking. He was paraded before reporters and returned to Altiplano, the same prison from which he had escaped last July. This time, he is rotated from cell to cell to cell. Guards are circulated every 15 minutes through whatever cell he happens to be occupying on that particular day. The U.S. Justice Department wants Guzman extradited, brought here to face charges for his crimes. Seven separate jurisdictions, including New York, Chicago, and San Diego, all want to put El Chapo on trial. Juan Pedro Badillo is a lawyer who only has one client, El Chapo. He warns extradition can be a lengthy process. How long do you think the whole extradition legal proceedings will go on? 10, 15, 20 years perhaps. Or it could be one or two years. El Chapo Guzman knows that if he is ultimately extradited to the United States, it's essentially game over for him. Soon after Chapo's arrest, the U.S.-Mexico task force captured another two dozen Sinaloa cartel members. It sends an incredibly powerful message to current kingpins, to future narco-traffickers, that you may run, you may hide, but ultimately, this multinational force will track you down from the highest mountains or the deepest, darkest jungles or through the stinking sewers of towns and cities anywhere in the world and bring you to justice.